Please help me give him a warm welcome and put your hands together for Kathy Craven. Hello and welcome to Artists Working with Artists. And as he said, I'm Kathy Craven. I am the program director for the Media Communications program here at Full Sail University. And I'm really excited about our guests um, because I think they're going to have a couple of things to say about collaboration. Um, we have Tim Naylor. Uh, Tim is a creative technologies consultant, Hall of Fame 6 inductee, 1997 digital media grad. Uh, Tim's childhood love for creatures has evolved into a successful career in computer graphics. So he made monsters his thing. Uh, so he's actually made Megatron move in Transformers. He's uh, buzzed droids open and closed in Star Wars Episode Three: Rev Revenge of the Sith, and gave Davy Jones tentacles the ability to play the piano in Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, a film that won the best visual effects uh, at the Academy Awards in 2007. So, really cool guy. Uh, yeah, Thank let's you. give it up for him. Thank you. Ow! And we have Marcella Areca who is an audio engineer, Hall of Fame 4 inductee, 2002 recording arts grad. Uh, Marcella, also known as Ms. Lago, right? Um, knew that she wanted to work in Miami, Florida at the Hit Factory. While she was a student at Full Sail's recording arts program, she called the studio manager every couple of months to check in. Her persistence paid off, and after graduation in 2002, she interviewed and was offered a job as a general assistant. Two months later, she got her chance to prove herself uh, and her potential behind the console on a session with Missy Elliott. She's worked uh, with all kinds of artists, Madonna, Snoop Dogg, Nelly Furtado, Furtado Christina Aguilera, and many more. Uh, recently, uh, Marcella teamed up with record producer T D Danja to launch an independent label, New Age Stars Records. Uh, most recently, the two opened Dream Asylum Studios, a dazzling recording environment that has captured the sounds and artists like Monica and Kay Michelle. Uh, Marcella was instrumental in the design and development of an expansive South Florida space, which spans 4,000 square feet and features multiple studios, a live room, and inspired areas for creating and collaborating. We have Kim Alpert. Kim Alpert is an artist and creative strategist, Hall of Fame 5 inductee, 2003 digital media grad. Kim believes first and foremost in human-centric design and integrating technology and strategy in her time-based work. With a background in fine art, music, and carpentry, she brings an attention to detail and diverse styles to both her video installation and advertising work. Yeah. Uh, Kim is a creative professional, has worked with top advertising agencies for more than a decade, developing expertise in building prog uh, programmatic creative executions that merge aesthetics, psychology, and technology. As a curator, she has produced events uh, for gallery exhi exhibitions to large festivals and has displayed her original work in places like uh, Sofa Expo, uh, the large modern wing at the Art Institute in, of Chicago, the Facet Cinematheque. Uh, Kim's art primarily focuses on humanism, media, and change. Love that. All right, so we today, yay. <laughs> yay, you guys. So. Thanks for being here. This is an incredibly important topic. I cannot stress enough, and some of our students are in the audience and they've heard me say ad nauseum, so, but I'm kind of like the mom, so they would need to hear from you about collaboration and how important the skill sets and communication, all, all of that are to your actual creative process. <clears throat> so let's dive in. I really am curious. I'm gonna start with you, Marcella, and tell us about that collaborative space um, so basically, working with artists um, is 
not an easy task. <laughs> As you can imagine, collaboration is something that is a lot of fun, but it also requires a lot of, you know, pulling from the ideas that are in their head that they don't necessarily know how to convey. Um, so it can come in, 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 in ways and words that, you know, leaves your head scratching. Um, but it's sort of what's fun, you know, because there's a challenge behind it. And, you know, at the end of the day, when you get that end result, it's almost like, you know, knowing that you created something from inception. So, you know, collaboration is, is key to, you know, having something that is amazing. What inspired the actual physical space that you created most recently, that it, the collaborative space? So Tell Dream Asylum that. Studios, it started off with a thought um, probably around 2004. Uh, I was working, I don't know, like 90, 100 hours a week at the Hit Factory in Miami working with a producer by the name of Timberland. And I was also working with Danger at the time, which is my current uh, production partner. And we just said, like, it really was a dream. It was literally like us just saying, like, you know, one day I hope we can have money to just open up our own studio so we can just get out of here, <laughs> you know? And, and it just was like, throughout the years of us working, we would work around the world at different studios, you know, New York, Atlanta, Vegas, London. Um, and, uh, it, and we just really took away bits and pieces from, you know, we were just inspired by different things that we fell in love with. And I always knew, actually during that conversation, I always said that if we ever made a, designed the studio, that I would want John Stork to design it because I was just so like intrigued by his rooms. And every room that I ever worked in around the world, I knew it was a John Stork room. So when I decided to, um, or when we decided to, to build the studio, it was, uh, it was a no-brainer. It was like, all right, we need Walter Stork Design Group. And, you know, um, we just collaborated on every idea down to the exact, to the name of the studio. Um, we both decided, you know, you choose one, one word and I choose another and I choose dream because it started off as a dream and he chose asylum because, you know, it is the crazy house, <laughs> you know, working in a studio with no windows. You never know what time of the day it is. So Dream Asylum Studios was born out of an idea from... 10 years prior from the opening of the doors. Cool. Nice. Yeah. So I'm going to throw this out to anybody who wants to start it off. Um, what does effective collaboration look like? Everyone is different. Every artist is different. So it's mm -hmm. going to be different. And when you're, I just was like, I'm taking this. Um, <laughs> we knew. Go Kim. It, yeah. You know, because it's, and it's different at different times with each collaboration because you're building trust. Mm. And you're building a vocabulary because you don't do the same thing. So I work with a lot of incredibly talented musicians. I build really complicated video systems that I perform live. And the performances that I do are all improvisational. So there's an incredible amount of trust, uncertainty, and chaos. Mm -hmm. And the trust has to be really, really high to get those other two and not have like a total disaster um, so far. I have not had one. <laughs> um, eh, no, that's not true. I think I've had one, but it's only been a disaster for me. Like no one else has known. I've had like a secret inside one. Um, yeah, it's a lot of patience of having to learn what someone else's language is and then kind of help very slowly guide them into understanding and show them that you understand. You know, that it's as important that you show them that you know what they're talking about, even if you don't agree. Um, to help get into that commonality, you know, and that's at every stage, at every new project, at every show, you know, I've been out with the same band where we're doing the same show, but each show is different because it's going to change and you have to be able to pivot really, really quickly. How do you show them that you're right there, that you're, that you are understanding what it is that they need? In the moment or before the show? In the moment. In the moment. I realized something a couple years ago as the, the groups were getting bigger and the shows were getting larger, that I was experiencing what people like about baseball. And I never, I'm not a sports person, so like, 
I knew, I asked my sister, because she's like a really big sports person, like, what? like, I don't understand baseball. And she was like, well, you gotta get into like the inside baseball, which is watching the players look at each other and, and speak in like a psychic talk that that's what they're doing. And then I saw in baseball they were doing that, but I don't know what they're saying, because I don't know anything about baseball. And particularly, I, I perform video with Mike Reed and Mike Reed's Flesh and Bone, and he's an incredible band leader, but he's a drummer. So he's like literally drumming, right? So then he has to look at Greg, and Greg is gonna look at Jason, and like they're all talking with their eyes about what's about to happen next, because they don't know who's about to solo. Like everybody is taking turns and doing a thing, so you have to be right there and understand that like this look is a lot different than this look. You know what I mean? And like it may not be the angry this, it might be the like, wow, that's really good this. So there's like, two different muscles that you have to watch <laughs> and like know what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's incredible. And I feel like I hear it and I go out and see other bands and I know like, oh, this, this is conducting this and this person means that. And it's, it's just, a, it comes with time. It comes with practice. Like most things in this world, it comes with time and practice. And if you don't put in the hours, you're not, you're not gonna just get it, you know? Nobody wakes up tomorrow and like knows Japanese. <laughs> like, that's just not how it works. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, I think that to leverage off what you just said, that, that it just doesn't happen. Like we're not naturally necessarily collaborative people in, in all realms, across all efforts, across all teams. So as, as what Kim was saying about baseball and just doing things with that, that court presence, you know, where, where you kind of just know what the other person's going to do, that comes after a long time. And I think you, have, you unroll that to kind of go, well, how do, I, how do I get to the point where we can look at each other and just kind of know, you know right. what, what's coming up next? And so for, for students, I strongly encourage you, you're not, you might not come into an environment that's incredibly collaborative, but that doesn't preclude you from being an observationist. Right. Just really observing how teams are working, how people are communicating. Because when you observe how people work, I found when I, when I lead a team that some people need a lot of context, other people don't. Sometimes in a creative endeavor, isolation, like in writing, might be a really healthy thing. In a team environment, isolation is a really horrible thing. Because mm -hmm. if I don't know why my work product, if I don't know where it goes, if I don't know why I'm doing it, if I don't know what I'm going to be receiving, that isolation can actually kill it off. So it's required, but how you attain that course court presence is years of observation. I remember we did, uh, we did a test for Prometheus mm -hmm. and it was a non-approved test, but there was a, there were four of us that did a, uh, a baby, it was like a, a baby beluga alien that we wanted to do. And there was a world-class model around, I was rigging, we handed it to an animator and then we gave it to a guy who rendered it. There was not a, there was no producer, there was no schedule, there was no nothing. We hardly even talked and we just knew I just knew I just knew what the animator needed. The modeler knew what made it look right. We just kind of knew, but we are all twenty year mm -hmm. you know veterans doing that. Mm -hmm. so as as students watch, observe, learn the vernacular of the studio and the language that's happening every day. so you, one day you can get to that that look <laughs> or <Yeah>. this look <laughs> and know what's going on. Yeah. so when you first can you guys think of a, a time when you first graduated and you first hit a collaboration and ran up against some conflict, ran up against some challenge, ran up against different ideas of the vision. How did you, how did you handle it then and how have you evolved? Well, <clears throat> when you first start out, um, you honestly, when, you, when there is conflict, and I'm speaking from an engineer's point of view, you have to understand the players that are in the room in the studio. You know, there's going to be a producer, there's an artist, um, songwriters, an engineer. And in the beginning and sometimes even current, you know, day status, sometimes the engineer is probably going to be like the last one to say something. Um, unless they come to you directly and say, what do you think? Um, you know, because it, it, it's sort of like, a, you know, Producer, it, their, their job is to actually create what's happening and kind of bring that vision together. And producers, an, enge an engineer can be a producer as well, but if there is another producer who's sitting there doing all the musicality behind it, you have to just know your positioning and just don't just, you know, uh, come out forward with it. And when there is conflict, honestly, you have to pick your battles. 
You know, not everything is going to be like, okay, you know what? I don't necessarily agree with that, so I'm just going to speak my mind and, and then just screw up all the vibe in the room, you know? And sometimes if there is something that I don't agree with, I still follow through with the idea because then I realize maybe I was wrong. You know, maybe, you know what? That actually was good. I just had to really just do it. You have to kind of sometimes get out of your own way and your own ego and whatever you think because... Collaboration is should be about everybody that's in the room, you know what I mean? Unless you think somebody's a complete knucklehead. But, you know, <laughs> just try to avoid the, uh, you know, all the, uh, the, the, the negativity that can come from any type of conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you. For, go ahead. Oh, it's, it's Kim. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> that was the look. Don't worry about it. She's gonna, something happened, yeah. don't worry about it. I fixed it. Uh, that may be the only time, so okay, go Yeah, ahead. I'm going to take it now. <laughs> uh, I am not good with conflict. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a traditionally a people pleaser trying to get out of that. And I, and I think when you take on any leadership role, if you don't have your strategy on how to work through conflict, something bad's going to happen. So as you try to master your craft and hope and hope to one day be in a supervisory kind of role or in a position to make that creative decision, you should really have a good handle on your conflict resolution strategy for lack of better terminology. Mm -hmm. And the way I look at conflict now is that for me, I break it down into two things. I break it down to fear or pride. Mm -hmm. Because if you're only dealing with the surface situation, you're never really going to solve or convert that person into more of a team collaborator, or you're not going to be able to filter what they're saying because it's occluded by their pride or occluded by their fear when they might be presenting you the best solution and you can't hear it. So I try to take a step back and try to figure out, is there fear that's being played out because some person is going to feel insecure or not valued or disrespected by the result of the decision or what's happening? Or is it pride that's getting in the way and really preventing the team from, you know, kind of becoming a team and moving forward? And I'm not sure yet exactly how to address either. I'm, a, I'm only at the part right now <laughs> of being able to really, in a healthy way, try to be able to identify and uncover what's really happening and work with people to kind of, sure, we can talk about that decision in a moment, but what does that make you feel if we do this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and instead of just focusing on only the decision, really trying to get them to open up a little bit about what are you going to feel if we, if we, if a happens, what, what does that mean for you? Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you're as a leader, you're kind of projecting a little bit forward into their world to try to understand the impact and so it, it kind of offsets them a little bit mm -hmm. and set, tries to settle them down a little bit is what mm -hmm. I found. I'm still not that good at it, but I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to understand how to, how to walk through it as a people pleaser. It'll take us mm -hmm. the lifetime. Go Marcella, ahead, Marcella said something really important. Um, two, well, a lot of things that are always important, but two <laughs> specific things that to this are like so important that I was talking to with somebody uh, this morning, and it's early now, and we've already talked about it, um, which is position. You know, and I think I was I was looking to be in a really high position really early mm. and I, I butted my head up against a lot of projects. I walked off of a lot of projects that I didn't feel I was given um, a fair listen and things like that. And, and, and maybe I wasn't and it was a good thing that I left probably. But, you know, there's probably some interesting big things that I could have learned sooner mm. had I been more willing to be you know, uh, in a more assistant role. And I think that's, you know, it's not a bad thing. You know, you're starting out. You're not supposed to be Scorsese on day one. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's just not how it works. And I think a lot about, I make a lot of food analogies because it's really easy because like everybody eats. Like if you want to be the chef where people just come in and they eat whatever it is that you cook because it's always super good you gotta be like the really, the best onion cutter first. <laughs> and then you gotta be the best sous chef and work with a really great head chef. And then eventually you like work up that way. It's all art, you know, like that's the culinary art. Like it's not different for us, mm. you know, it's a really, really important thing. Um, and I've sat, you know, when I was in my really early twenties at a video console <clears throat> with Brian Rollman, who's a phenomenal video artist. And he was like, yeah, I'm doing this festival. You want to sit here? And I literally just sat behind him 
at the console to like watch him do live video. And it was amazing, you know? And it was so useful to have sat there at like 22 and seen him mix for Erica Badu and Jill Scott and what it's like to be on a stage with a crowd of that size so that when I'm doing a crowd that's a tenth of that size and I have to be the one with my hands on the button, you know, the anxiety's not there. You don't want that to be the first time when you're the one that's pressing the button that you've been in front of it, you know? Like that's a really great practice um, and I offer that to folks all the time. You know, because that's how, you know, it's not, you're not not learning by watching. Yeah, know? absolutely. You know, Mar Marcella said something amazing. She's like, wow. I'm, I'm mixing. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go, you're you the know, oracle. I, that's I'm, why we invited I, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm mixing. And so Thank I you. have my hands on the creative, <laughs> the creative ability here, but there's a producer in the room. And so what that speaks to for me, what I, what I interpret that in my own language is know your place. Mm -hmm. And I think we lose that in our, so here's my personal, just Tim. I think we've lost some of that um, language in, in the workforce world of knowing your place, that it's okay to know your place mm -hmm. when you can post whatever you want on social media and everyone seems to have the entitlement mm -hmm. to their opinion. But the reality is that when you get into a situation and there is a producer sitting behind you, you have to really understand when you can say something or not. A student asked me yesterday, what was your greatest, one of your greatest mistakes in, in your career? I said, when I got to ILM, I was so hot to trot to like prove myself and do this and do that. I, I didn't take the time to sit with people who really knew what they were doing. And I might not have agreed with how they were doing, or I might have known how to make it twice as fast, but I never said, why do we do it this way without a cr critical yeah. attitude to it? But just like, hey, can you, exp you've, you've been doing this for so long. You've been doing movies when I was a kid. How do you, why are we doing it? Why do we do How did you come to doing it this way? Wow, that's fascinating. Because without knowing that full context, they're never going to listen to my idea if I don't respect what they went through to get where right. they're at. So knowing your place, when there's a producer in the room, when there's another person, when I think, I'm, I'm worried that, from a society perspective, we're losing. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways to enable your opinion to make it sound like it's awesome because you can say it or type it. But in the workforce, there's many times we just gotta shut up yeah. <laughs> and prove that you can do it before you open your mouth. You're a technician, you know? Like a lot of times, you know, we came here to get trained and the people who are bringing us on, they want us, they're paying for our hands. They're paying for their ideas to get transmuted through our knowledge and then with our hands to be able to craft their vision. And that is a really important collaborative role. And then sometimes you get to be the artist too and then they're paying for your brain and your hands and your brain gets to actually like argue back and forth with them. But not every project is that way, mm -hmm. you know? I don't show up to a show expecting to be on stage. That's like, that's up, that's up to whoever has asked me to be there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm in the wing Sometimes I'm at front of house, and then sometimes they're like, no, you're gonna be right on the stage today. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the title, uh, or in the description of this session, it uses the word compromise. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. So does that mean giving up your voice? Does that mean finding middle ground? Does that mean something else? What do you guys think about compromise? It's about the project, the vision, mm -hmm. you know? So the, the compromise, it can't be me versus you. Mm -hmm. It's what's gonna make the idea the best that it can be, you know? And I've, I've been wrong as many times as I'm right, you know? And you gotta trust the people that you're working with, that they're, like, they're good. You chose to do this project because they're good and that they have, have faith that they know where you're going, you know? There's a lot of times where, um, you know, because I work with a lot of jazz musicians, like they don't, necessarily have as much experience in visuals or visual language or film or any of that that I do. And they'll be like, no, I really want this specific thing. And I'll be like, okay. And in my mind, I'm like, that's gonna look terrible. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. you know what I mean? But you know, you know a, a lot of the time, if not you know, most of the time, it, it actually is really cool. And it's something that I just, because I have all of my experiences, 
I, I had a preconceived notion that maybe something wouldn't work or we couldn't do it this way. And because they don't have the limitations of my experience, mm. they can push me in a place. And that's, yeah. it's important to trust that like someone might know more than you, even if they don't know more than you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, compromise isn't always a bad thing, you know? It's actually like a really, really good, healthy thing that makes the work way better. I had a dancer, I have a piece called Scan Lines that is uh, two Bouteau-inspired dancers and two musicians and a large feedback vortex. And one of the dancers, and it's all improvisational with this narrative that we go through, and one of the dancers in one of the times that we ran it got really aggressive and all of a sudden she had like a glove in her mouth and she was like down on all fours and I was like at the console like where are we going? What is happening? <laughs> like it got really, really heavy and really aggressive and in the moment I was like this is not, and it's my piece, it's my work and my, you know, thing and I was like this is not what I want and I was watching it getting like really nervous and like my mom was there or something and uh, <laughs> and afterwards, every single person in the audience was like, that was incredible. Mm. I had no idea she was going to do that. And then she had the glove in her mouth, and then the other girl was pulling it. Like, it, it was this whole thing. And because it was so different from what I had kind of laid the foundation for, I was really reluctant to love it because it was too, it, they had gone too far outside of where I thought the walls were. Um, and it actually worked really, really well, mm. really, really well. Um, so yeah, those things happen. Yeah, no compromise. <clears throat> it's a bit of like um, tug of war, but not war. I don't like the word war. Everything that Kim said is exactly like the same feeling, you know what I mean? Um, it's definitely about meeting in the middle. It's not giving up your voice. Mm -hmm. It's just give, take, you know, taking a little bit of what they want and making the idea happen, but maybe sprinkling a little bit of what you want to do without it like overpowering their idea. And it's almost like psychological because it's almost like they don't even know that you just sprinkled a little bit of your fairy dust on <laughs> to the, you know, uh, onto the idea, um, you know, but the idea is there and then you almost feel just as like, okay, you know, that's cool, you know, but I definitely don't think compromise is about giving up your voice. It's not like that at all, you know, un unless whoever you're working with is just, you know, Gestapo behind your neck, looking at you, making sure that you are doing exactly, you know, what they say. And it's not usually like that. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's literally just a conversation. And like I said before, it's really picking your, your battles. You know, you may not like it. You may not like it, but the truth is when you finally do kind of unravel that idea that you thought you didn't like, like Kim said, it actually turned out to be really cool. It's just because it, it's, it just may not be something that you've ever done or in my world, I'm hearing it in my head and it's not that great. But once I actually do it, I'm like, wait, that actually is cool. And then you can actually take the idea and just further expand it into something even better. And, you know, like I said, that's, uh, you know, you're compromising, but without, you know, just completely not having a, no voice in it. Mm. No. Yeah. My, um, for me, compromise, uh, maybe I'm getting old, but my, my, uh, my compromise situation is I, um, as I've gone through and been a junior, an intermediate, a senior, an employer, um, my compromise has become, I'll compromise on whatever you want creatively as long as I understand how it impacts the people that I'm responsible for. Mm. So the, knowing where your line is um, it, for me, I'm very flexible in creative decision making, technological, like which tech stack are we using? Um, I, I'd, I'd like to say that I'm pretty flexible about that kind of stuff unless people are going to get really impacted by it. Um, and what, what I've learned from the mistakes I've made in, in the industry is not understanding the context in which a lot of decisions were made, thinking that, well, why didn't they do it this way? Why was that creative decision made and, and not taking the time to discover that there were all kinds of constraints that I didn't understand because I was never in those meetings. I mm -hmm. shouldn't have been in those meetings. Um, and that's why that decision was made. Oh, I understand a little bit more. So for me, the compromise um, where I kind of dig in a little bit is on schedule, on budget, on pe people impact mm -hmm. is where I've 
after years of doing it, have kind of said, this is where the compromise is something where I, I know where my line is. I'm much more flexible in these other areas, maybe the creative areas, maybe the technological areas, or if a technology is being chosen that I know is going to impact people because it's not the most you know, optimized way of doing things, then I'll speak up and I'll say, you know, we're gonna wind up here on Saturday because you're making that, you're choosing that tech over that one. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we need, we need to discuss that now because I, I don't want to be here on a Saturday because you don't understand what I do. Right. So yeah. um, for me, it's come over the years, it's kind of formed into when I want to um, have my voice in the mix is if I feel like the people I'm responsible for or myself directly are going to be compromised in some way. Mm. So I'm gonna throw you might not win all those battles, but at least you can, at least you can present your case. Yeah. I'm going to throw one more question at you guys, which is something we hear a lot around here. And then I'm going to throw it to the audience. Uh, what, what do you do about people that don't deliver in a collaboration? Mm. I had a, I don't, maybe this is, this is kind of a little bit different because it's not as collaborative. It's somebody who like works for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, I have a person that I w I've been so excited to like bring onto the team and like knows a lot of video stuff. And we had two run-ins where I was like super disappointed, where I was like, hey, I need you to do this and that and then get back here before the show. And there like was definitely not enough time. And then he didn't make it back. And then that like totally messed up me having my assist at the show, which, you know, it was, you know, New York Jazz Fest, no big deal. You know? <laughs> um, and then it happened kind of like mini again. <laughs> and, I, and, and it was about like an alarm and like he, like, and like who, who is in charge of time, right? But I'm like, dude, you're like you, like that's why you're here so that I can be a child, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I was upset and I was kind of like really disappointed. And then I sat with it before we really talked about it, and I was like, get to the root of it. Because mm. you like this guy, like you know he's really smart, you know he's super capable. Get to the root of what's happening here. And then I realized, he thinks I know what I'm doing. Mm. <laughs> like big time. Yeah, he made an assumption. And, and I don't really know what I'm doing most of the time. And I was like, and then I said to him, I was like, you really think I know what I'm doing all the time? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. I'm just following whatever you say. I'm, do I'm doing it. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> I was like, that's the problem. Big mistake. That's the problem here. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm giving you a thing that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And you need to let me know if it's not possible, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it was like, a t like, I was like, oh, my God, our whole relationship now is going to be better. Because I thought this person, like, wasn't delivering, and I was getting really disappointed. And, and I was like, oh, yeah, dude, no way. If I say we need to be somewhere at 5, and you think that I have the alarm for 4, your alarm should be 345. <laughs> you know? Like, and it's just stuff like that. Like, he, he wanted me to be the big, the big leader and have everything really buttoned up. But I'm an artist. That's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, like that's you're, a lot of times, you know, your junior is your mama. They're who takes mm -hmm. care of you. You know, mm -hmm. um, I have a good buddy, Steve, who works for me. And like, you know, when he first started his first day, he was like, how can I be good at this job? And I was like, if you know when I need a glass of water and then you have it in your hand, mm -hmm. that's I will never fire you. <laughs> I get I get into such a little, you know, <laughs> like into a frenzy of work and get dehydrated. And it's mm -hmm. like, man, if, if you're there with the water, mm -hmm. like that's it, you know, <laughs> everything else, you'll figure it out and you'll learn. But like interpreting my needs is mm -hmm. like the biggest thing. Cause I'm, I, I'm like a little weirdo child. That's like the fun part of being an artist <laughs> is to be that careless and ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> hope it keeps up. Um, Marcella, were you going to comment on um, when they don't deliver, see, in the business, it's a, it's a really small world. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you're working with somebody that doesn't necessarily get things done or get the job done, it's, you don't get hired again, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. plain and simple. simple. Um, <laughs> recent, well, not recently, maybe about seven months ago, um, I was working in New Orleans on a session uh, for an artist uh, named Normandy. And uh, it was like a big writing camp. We had a bunch of writers and 
They were specifically selected to work on this project um, from the producers and some were recommended by the record labels or whatnot and management. And, you know, each day everybody kind of had their own, you know, everybody was sort of put into, you know, like their own uh, rooms or whatnot. And there was just one writer that, you know, everybody was looking to like really bring forth these like great ideas, but for whatever reason, like she was just like not there, you know, and then she would disappear, and then she would come back, and then she would be at Starbucks. And then before you know it, we never had a song that come out of that room, you know, and mm -hmm. it was just like such of a waste of a day. And, you know, and everybody was kind of looking at us like, well, what, what, you know, what do you guys got? I'm like, well, we don't have anything, <laughs> you know, like the, 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 uh, the writer who was supposed to just kind of really bring the ideas. So anyway, like it, it, we just, she ended up getting sent home early. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just sort of one, that's just like one thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it's important. There's dollars, there's cents being spent. And, you know, when you're just not there and you're not focused and you can't deliver, it hurts, you know? We're all there. I always say, like, don't, I don't really, you know, for me, time is more valuable than actual money. Mm -hmm. And when you waste people's time, it, like, it impacts more than when you lose money, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So I think, you know, I think everybody in business has that same model in their head and, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a reputation, so you have to be really mm -hmm. careful mm -hmm. because your name is all you got in the business. And if people start talking like, no, nah, you know, she just doesn't, she just can't do it, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. the phone won't ring anymore, mm -hmm. you know? And then you find yourself without a job, mm -hmm. you know, and it's... Yeah, not cool. <laughs> yeah. Tim, did you want to comment? Well, I, I think we all don't deliver in some way, even if we've mm -hmm. delivered something on time or to a client that has met satisfactory but as an artist sometimes you don't feel like you were able to give the perfect piece away so I always try to give some grace to if that someone might is probably in the course of their career not going to deliver something what I look for is work ethic mm -hmm. so to, to your point of like if mm -hmm. if you don't know the skill I can help teach it to you or I can find other people to help mentor if you um, have things that just happen in life, life happens. So I'd, I'd love to see a good amount of grace in different work environments because we're human beings, we're fallible, things are gonna go bump in the night, it's what happens. Mm -hmm. What I think is the distinguishing factor is that if other people are hustling and you have a crappy work ethic, then you need to go mm -hmm. because the impact is on others. If you have a good work ethic, but you're just, you just need some more skill, you just need to be trained a little bit more, you need some encouragement, whatever, then I, I don't mind rallying. And, and actually, the time I would invest in getting your skill, helping you move those skills up is I'm not investing in your skills, I'm investing in the continuation of your work ethic that's then going to give and pay off dividends in the future for the company multiple times over. So the ROI on that investment in, in an individual will definitely pay off because they'll feel like, okay, they see that I'm trying. Um, so really it's about work ethic and I kind of try to sniff that out as early as possible because there's everything's such a big team these days. No matter what, you, you'll find that Mm -hmm. across any Hall of Fame discipline, any, any program that you guys are going through, there's, you're going to wind up on a team somewhere. Like, mm -hmm. unless you're freelancing, but then you have a client, then you and the client are the team, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so no matter how you get around it, um, your work ethic is going to be what starts to speak volumes in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you need to learn a new piece of software and you're a little slower, that's okay. But I know that on other shows, you, you were hustling all the time. Mm. And that doesn't mean abusing your time. It just means I want to see I want to see a work ethic. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm going to make sure you guys have time. So turn it over to questions. Who's got some questions to start off? Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta do it one more time <laughs> for my Round people two. on the web. <laughs> so, if you are um, employers, is collaborating with your employees different from collaborating with 
like another company. So. Oh, I have a very funny situation with one of my employees because he's also the band leader for one of the festivals that I play. Mm. So I'm also sometimes his employee, <laughs> which is really fun. Um, and also sometimes very complicated. Um, but no, you know, like it's, if you're gonna have like a, like I'm the big diva, I'm in charge here. Like you can like have that until you've had your second cup of coffee. You know what I mean? Like you can't really keep that up um, cause you're gonna wind up alone. So it, it is a really collaborative thing um, all of the time, you know, all of my people. I did a really massive installation um, last week and it was, it was one day and there was no possibility of failure. Um, they gave us a lot of trust to go into the conservatory in Chicago, the Garfield Park Conservatory that's like 120 years old. And you couldn't have a screen, you couldn't rear project, you couldn't bring in any kind of like CO2, you couldn't bring in any helium, there was no ability to rig in the ceiling, and they wanted to do this big projection for the stage and all this stuff. So I got this crazy idea that I was gonna build um, a pyramid out of balloons, and then I was gonna string it up above the band, and then I was gonna double project onto it. It's not exactly something I can test, <laughs> so everybody had to kind of like chip in and we had a team of five and we were just, we were the Balluminati. We were there all day. Balluminati. <laughs> Balluminati. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome, you know, and it was, it was, it was great. And I had, you know, uh, it was like this super sweetheart homie crew and it, they, they would be like, hey, how do we do this? And I was like, I've never built a pyramid out of balloons before, you know? <laughs> I'm like, you know, I've twisted a poodle when I was 11. Uh, so there's a lot of like, how would you do it, you know? And like, I think that makes for me being a good employer. And I think the people who are like, I have an idea. Can we do it this way? That makes them good employees. And it was a, it was a long day, but it looked amazing, you know? And nobody that was there would have known that none of us have ever built a balloon installation at that scale before. Um, so it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's really fun. A lot of the stuff that I do is uh, very kind of proof of concept. Okay, we built, I have like a miniature stage in my studio. It literally is this big with a miniature projector and miniature lights. So I'll build things at like a fraction scale with like little tiny mirrors. And then I'll be like, cool, all right, so I'm gonna do this thing, and then uh, we're gonna put, we're gonna rebuild it ten times bigger, and put this artist inside of this like rotating kaleidoscope. But like, I can't get that artist to like come to my studio to like test it. So everything has to kind of happen live in real time on the set before the show. So there's a ton of um, a ton of really important listening that I have to do to my team um, as far as what what they see and what they think and what might work. Um, if I bullishly thought that I was the only one that could execute this, I would have a lot of fails. I would have a lot of fails. And you know, that's, my phone rings because I don't have fails. You know, because I always have a plan B and a plan C and if this doesn't work and if, you know, all the balloons explode, what are we gonna do? Um, and I did have a balloon explode actually. We did two shows and at the proof of concept, we were, um, with this really incredible Ethiopian artist and one of the balloons exploded and like, not like exploded, but like popped and it like flew a balloon. And I was like, oh my God, what is this band gonna do? Like, these are all like super heavy musicians. And the keyboard player was like in a solo and then the balloon flew out and then he like finished his solo and he grabbed the balloon and he threw it over this crowd of like, you know, <laughs> 700 people and the crowd went bananas and it was like, thank God that worked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, thank God no more fell. Cause you know, that's just how it was. And, and my team knew, they knew how I felt in that moment and they came, like, it was just, it's perfect. You know, when you have the right people, it's perfect. It's flawless. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like you've choreographed the dance of the day a thousand times in rehearsals, and you would never know that we're all just on the seats of our pants. And it's the, mo it's, for me, it's the most fun, anxiety-inducing thing in the entire world, you know? As, as an employer, my, as a past employer, um, you have an opportunity, I, I would consider it a responsibility, um, but I, I think you have a great opportunity to create an inviting culture 
where you don't you aren't seen as boss because what will initially happen is people will naturally shut down because they know you're going to make the final decision. It's okay to be the one who makes the final decision. That's okay. It's about how you arrive to that decision. And so you have an opportunity to create an environment where people can speak into that decision, knowing that you'll make the final decision, but at least they can be heard, they can be respected, and they have the opportunity to speak up. Mm -hmm. um, we, I did digital humans. So we did the Michael Jackson, we rebuilt Michael, um, and we were working on the, our next digital human. We transitioned to like a software agile development scrum environment where everyone was in the room standing up talking about what they needed. And for artists, that's a really intimidating thing. And it, so it took about six months for artists to kind of convert into where they really enjoyed it and saw the power of it. But you, the reason why we did that is everyone then had a chance to speak into the process figure out where the broken parts were, where the empty gaps were, where the needs were. Um, but if, you, if you're not cultivating that and, design, and showing them why it works so that they actually can have a voice and say, I'm not getting what I need. Why aren't you getting what you need? Well, I don't want to throw that person under the bus, but it seems like we're having a te technical issue. I didn't know that. How do we address it? How do we fix that? So there's, there's an opportunity as a, from, a, from a leadership standpoint to cultivate an environment where those kind of collaborative things can actually be fostered. If you jump into an environment where that doesn't exist, serve the employee next to you, figure out what the person upstream, what they, if they need something and find out who your downstream client is, even if they're on the same level as you, consider them your client. Find your client if you're not the, you know, if you're not the final decision maker, create a client. If I deliver something to someone else, make them your client in your mind so you can build that collaborative process. All right, let's take another question. Just not from Jack Eckler. <laughs> yeah. How you guys doing? My name is Isaiah Mosley. I'm a music business student here. Um, in the era of collaboration and like working independently like through Full Sail or by any other means, you know, before you're like in the music industry, you know, working with like labels and whatnot. How do you protect yourself like as a songwriter, like working with other artists? Cause you have to have the mindset that like anything you help someone create has a potential to go somewhere. So on the come up, how do you like address that and like protect yourself so that way you can like, you know, get your rights if something happens to, you know, blow up? Oh my God, can I answer this? Because I had a Go ahead, one. I'll, I'll just come back. I'm sorry, I like, do your thing. Because I don't know if we're gonna have the same answer, but like, oh my God, I reviewed some work and this, the, the work that I looked at yesterday in this portfolio had like the person's like Instagram watermark on all these beautiful designs. And I was like, why is this here? And he's like, well, somebody steals my stuff. And I was like, you should be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, you know, man, like if somebody took the stuff that I made when I was at Full Sail, you know, a bazillion years ago, and that stuff wound up on the Sundance channel, please, please, you know what I mean? Please, let it get 100,000 views, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not looking for the big payday today, I'm looking to eat steak when I'm 70. Like, it's my art. And like, the same, the same way now, you know, like, I go back and forth with like, whether or not I wanna put stuff out and this and that, but at the end of the day, like, you know, we're all, you know, trying to get to the ultimate goal of life, which is death, right? <laughs> so, you know, if you can get enough exposure early on, you're going to be good, right? Like, don't worry as much about that big payday now. Like, maybe care a little bit more about that when you turn 30 or 40 or 50. You know what I mean? Like, that kind of stuff to me, like, don't protect it. Don't make it too precious. Like, get it out there. Don't, like, overly rights manage yourself to death. And, you know... If it's another person who's like a young person and they don't have a lot of bread and you're trying to like make a collaborative thing and get it out there, like get it out there, you know? Get more people to see it because like, like what, what, who is the guy that discovered Justin Bieber? Like if he wasn't putting his weird old stuff on YouTube, then like whoever it was that found him like would never have found him, you know, if he was concerned with those little songs he was putting online and he did pretty well for himself, you know? I think the Bieb did pretty good. You know, <laughs> seems like it's Beebs working out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But listen, I think there's also this like tale of, I mean, we have heard the stories where people get, you know, duped and they don't get their credit and whatnot. 
But for the most part, believe me, when you're colla- when you're in the room writing, producing, whatnot, with another artist, it is it, for the most part there. It's a, there's a line of respect there that you are part of the creation process. Um, so I don't think there needs to be this big fear about, oh my God, how do I get this copyrighted? I mean, honestly, if you really want to just do like, what do they call that? The, the poor man's copyright? <laughs> In the session, to throw on your video and record some of the process. So if it ever comes down to it, be like, you see, I was in the room when I did this, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, like, there's so many ways. If you really want to get into the real legalities of it, you know, um, get, get a team together. You're going to need an attorney, you know, and have constant communication with your team, your management, your attorney. Hey, last night I was in the studio with so-and-so, and they don't even have to be a big artist. Your attorney might be you know, like, who, well, who's that? And then, you know, at least kind of keep the communication going so that there's some type of paper trail going on. But then that can become expensive because the minute you talk to your attorney, they hit the clock, you know what I mean? And if they, you don't have them on retainer, then you're literally paying for them, you know, by the hour um, or a pre- prorated percentage of that. Um, so, I mean, honestly, like, I think you just have to, like Kim said, put the work out there and believe me, once the work is out there, people want to know, well, who, who did this? And if you're working with, you know, a schmuck that just says, like, takes all the credit and gives you none, take that as a lesson. You can fight for it, of course, but take it as a lesson, you know what I mean? And, and just know karma yeah. will come full circle back around and reward you later. Mm-hmm. I just, like, I, I love what you said because it's true. Like, don't worry about it. Put it out there. Get yeah. Get your get 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 your work out there. You'll make another hit. Yeah. You, yeah. Use it as, <laughs> as a, if someone's picking up on your creative <laughs> ability and they're taking it and they're running with it, then let that be the confidence boost that you're going to be able to do that for yourself one day. That's what it, instead of wait, they just took something because mm-hmm. people are going to do that here and there, but know that wait, I can't, oh my gosh, that just happened. This is cool. Instead of them taking it from me, I actually realized that I can do it. So one day I'm going to make sure that I set it up and do it right for myself. So you, I, I would say use it as a confidence booster for your future. Very cool. That's a great note to end on. Unfortunately, our time is up, but want to really thank um, Kim and Marcella and Tim for being with us today. So let's give them a good big round of applause and thank you.